Hi, I'm Tony Gondola, welcoming you to the next edition of Stories from Space. Enjoy! The Space Shuttle. Even the name is iconic, and there's good reason for that. The shuttle was in operation for 30 years, starting with the first flight, STS-1, in 1981. If you were born sometime in the early 70s, it would be your only experience of American manned spaceflight until very recently. While not sporting a perfect flight record, it did take 355 astronauts into space with 133 successful launches. All this while delivering tons of material to low Earth orbit, including the Hubble Space Telescope and almost all of the International Space Station. In the early 70s, the Apollo Moon program was winding down. NASA and the military had a need for a way to get men and cargo into low Earth orbit cheaply and often. From that simple concept, the shuttle was born. All of the early versions involved a reusable orbiter that could fly back to Earth like an aircraft with a quick turnaround to do it again and again. In some cases, the booster could even be flown back by a separate crew. But the days of unlimited spending for Apollo were over. The shuttle we actually flew was very much compromised by price, political, and military pressure, some aspects of which we would come to regret. On June 4, 1974, Rockwell began construction of the first orbiter. Morton Thiokol would supply the huge solid rocket boosters with Martin Marietta supplying the external fuel tanks. The RS-25 main engines would be produced by Rocketdyne. The Space Shuttle is arguably the most complex spacecraft system ever flown. Going from zero to Mach 23 and back to zero again, with most of the system being reusable, is a tall order and in truth, never fully realized. Nevertheless, NASA charged ahead, beginning with the orbiter glide test with Enterprise in early 1977. The orbiter turned out to be a nice flying vehicle, but the big challenge was to come, protecting the vehicle during re-entry. Earlier spacecraft had depended on a heavy, thick, ablative-type heat shield that would slowly burn away, dissipating the heat. Shuttle needed something completely different. It needed to be very lightweight and reusable. The solution, ceramic tiles, light as a feather and fragile as a glass Christmas ornament, it took over 22,000 individually shaped tiles to protect the areas of the orbiter that would be subjected to high heating. Low temperature tiles and thermal blankets took care of the rest. It was a brilliant solution, but there is just one problem. They kept falling off. Since the loss of a single tile in a critical area would mean loss of the vehicle, this was not a small problem. It actually delayed the program for two years while a solution was found. Finally, on April 12, 1981, the first shuttle flew. This was an all-up flight test like no other. Other than drop test, you really couldn't just test parts of the system and you couldn't fly it unmanned. When it flew, it just had to work. And it did. At T minus five minutes, the APUs were started. These hypergolic fuel turbines supply the power to run the hydraulic system that controls all the control surfaces and other systems on the orbiter. At this point, the crew could feel the spacecraft coming alive beneath them. T minus five minutes and counting. Orbiter APU start. TLT OTC perform APU start. T-minus 31 seconds, and the orbiter's computers were given independent control of the vehicle and the launch sequence. And off to Atlantis's computers has occurred. 16 seconds before T-0, water at a flow rate of 900,000 gallons per minute floods the pad to protect it and the launch vehicle from the inferno to come. At T minus 6.6 .6 seconds, the three main engines come to life, generating a total of one and a half million pounds of thrust. Once clear of the pad, the shuttle rolls and pitches to put it on the proper flight path to reach the desired orbital inclination for the mission. The shuttle stack is somewhat fragile, so to reduce stress on the vehicle, the main engines are throttled back to approximately 65% shortly after the roll program is complete.
Even with reduced thrust, the shuttle gets up and going quickly, flying supersonic just 45 seconds after liftoff. At 35,000 feet, the main engines are throttled back up to 104%. Now that the solid rocket boosters have done their job, they're jettisoned. As the shuttle pushes to orbit powered by its three main engines, the boosters are allowed to free fall until they're low enough to deploy parachutes for a soft landing in the Atlantic, where they'll be picked up and towed back to the Cape for reuse. Now some eight and a half minutes after launch, the main engines shut down and the shuttle is in orbit. Almost. The external tank is released at this point because the initial orbit is low enough that the tank will re-enter the atmosphere and burn up fairly quickly. The orbit is then adjusted with a series of Ohms burns to the altitude needed for the mission. After completing a mission that could be as long as 14 days, it's time to come home. The payload doors are closed and the orbiter is maneuvered so that the Ohms engines are pointed backwards and at the proper angle. With precise timing, the Ohm's engines are fired in order to reduce velocity enough that the orbiter will encounter the first traces of the atmosphere at a precise point in time and space. Now the fun begins. Facing into the direction of travel and pitch nose up some 45 degrees, the orbiter is going so fast that the atmospheric gases literally don't have time to get out of its way. Instead, they get compressed and heated to a plasma reaching temperatures in excess of 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The orbiter is enveloped in a bright orange glow, using this energy to slow down. This is where the tiles just have to work. As it makes its way down through the atmosphere, the computer rolls the orbiter left and right to precisely manage the energy so that the orbiter reaches the landing area at the right speed and altitude. Approximately 25 miles from the runway, the commander takes control and flies the shuttle along a circular flight path called the landing alignment cylinder. This is to align the orbiter with the runway while shedding speed and altitude. Once aligned with the runway, the commander flies a steep glide slope of 22 degrees at 360 miles per hour, aiming for a point that's slightly short of the runway itself. At almost the last moment, the flare maneuver begins. The commander raises the nose to the proper attitude for landing. This trades speed for lift, allowing the craft to gently float in for a soft touchdown at 215 miles per hour. The space shuttle was truly an amazing accomplishment. While it never delivered the promise of cheap and easy access to space, it did accomplish much in giving the United States access to low Earth orbit for 30 years. The shuttle delivered some 3 million pounds of cargo to orbit and furthered understanding in many fields including material science and the study of the Earth's environment. The space shuttle was an amazing accomplishment that was very close to impossible. It's a testament to the abilities and dedication of the thousands of people who were involved with the program and made it a reality. We most certainly won't see anything like it for a very long time. Well, that wraps up our latest edition of Stories from Space. I hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to check this location for future updates and information. And for now, stay home, stay safe, and stay curious.